Plans presentation. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming and really thank you guys, our two presenters, for being here tonight and uh, for your time and your energy and your expertise and helping us to learn. So I'm going to start off and let you know who we are and why we pulled this presentation together. Um, we're just a small group of about six Phoenix and Rogue Valley residents that um, were concerned about the fate of the wetlands by Blue Heron Park when we found out that it was going to be developed. Um, and just speaking with neighbors and seeing the survey that went out and then also seeing the 10 pages of signatures on the petition, mm -hmm. we know that we aren't alone in being concerned about what would happen to this wetland. Mm -hmm. So um, we think this evening's presentation will help us learn about the importance of wetlands and maybe raise some awareness about what we are close to losing. Um, the purpose of tonight is just to educate. We're here to listen and learn about something that many of us probably know hardly anything about, that something is, but it's unique to um, the community land that we have. So there's a sign-up sheet back here, and I think you all signed up when you came in, so thank you. And so we'll keep in touch with you in the next few months and let you know how things go. And um, there's also some copies of the September 29th mail crib. Um, I don't know if you've all read it, but it was about the, the sale of the property. It was written by Mike Boone. Mm -hmm. And we have some copies over there. It's really good background information. I think there's six or seven copies. And then um, we also have a copy over there of our letter of concern that Christina um, Lefever uh, drafted and sent out to the uh, Department of State Lands really recently. So before I get to the agenda, um, we all, the six of us, wanted to just introduce ourselves, our names, and let you know where we live. So I'm Charlotte Poulos, and I've lived in Phoenix for about 14 years, and in the Valley for 37. So, Hala? I'm Hala Williams. Um, I bought my house on Church Street back in 2006. Uh, Penny? Um, <laughs> I've... Uh, lived in Phoenix and the last time I've lived here twice um, for seven years and then my kids graduated from Phoenix High School in our first reincarnation in Phoenix. So I've been here a long time. So it's Pam Thornhill. Um, let's see, Christina? Oh, okay. My name is Christina Lefever. I actually don't live in Phoenix. I live in Ashland, but I am part of Pollinator Project Road Valley. Mm -hmm. Also, Beyond Toxics, we're right there on Main Street, and we've been here in Phoenix since 2017, and um, glad to be here, and I just want to say thank you to all the community who are concerned about this wetland. I'm Marcia. Hi, Marcia. I'm Marcia and um, I live in Phoenix, and I've been here for 16 years. Mm -hmm. And Wanda. Wanda Borland. Hi, I'm uh, Wanda Borland, and I uh, volunteer for Pollinator Project Rogue Valley, um, making videos for them on important subjects such as this. Okay, so here's what we got planned tonight. Um, this four-minute looping video that Wanda made for us shows, it's amazing, it shows four days before the fire, just happened to have these pictures that Christina took of um, the house uh, that was there, you know. Mm -hmm. And then um, right after the fire, it loops to right after the fire, and then as it was greening up, and then actually um, it goes to day before yesterday when there's starting to be plantings and things back um, by the park. So that'll probably be turned off pretty soon. Um, the next part of the agenda is Hala has put together this cool information board here and it shows the history and timeline of what's happened um, so far and she'll share that. 
then Christina is going to introduce our two wetland specialists and say a few words on why educating ourselves is important when the wetland mitigation um, application um, is goes uh, up in front of the uh, Department of State lands that the purchaser has to do. So um, each speaker will have about 15 minutes each, and then we'll have a little question and answer session afterwards. And um, we should wrap it up by 7.30. And the bathrooms are out in the hallway. If anybody needs it. So, Kayla. Uh, we prepared a, a timeline to illustrate the flow of events concerning this property with the specific stepping stones along the way. Some of them you may be aware of and some of them maybe not, but we'll go through them right here. In 2015, Fiora, which is the Phoenix Urban Renewal Agency, uh, purchased the property for 324000 And then we had the fire on September 8th, 2020. Uh, and then James Beard offered 350000 to purchase the property for an RV park. He is uh, uh, with uh, BBMFR LLC. It's a development company, I believe. And he was invited to come tonight. Is he here? I don't, I don't think we saw him. Okay. Um, after that... Uh, on July 7th, less than a month later, there was a special FURA meeting with Christina Lefebvre, who you met from the Pollinator Project. And she was presenting uh, an idea for a Phoenix Outdoor Learning Center so that um, maybe kids can learn about wetlands. And um, this is a nice quote from her, calling it an irreplaceable asset. Um, the FIRA board then goes into an executive session to be briefed on the offer by James Beard, purchased the property for the RV park, and then and next month in August 31, FIRA counters the offer um, with a purchase price of 375. Uh, Beard uh, accepts that price. He's going to purchase at the 375. Um, on September 1, on September 13, Fiora has a special meeting enabling public to respond. On October 4, uh, Beard requests a delay of close of escrow from October 29th, 2021 to December 13th, 2021. Now a lot of these uh, items were reported on in a, uh, what Charlotte mentioned, an article by Tony Boom in the Medford Mail on September 29th of this year. And there's copies back on that table. Uh, I think Tony was invited. I don't know if he's here. Um, and also, I wanted to point out the uh, wetland delineation map, which was put together by Scott English. I think he is here. There he is. Thank you. Um, this shows the this shows the part of Heron Park. Um, this is his delineation map, and then this shows an aerial view where the RV proposal uh, proposed park would be, and this shows it in relation to all of Phoenix. So it's right, you know, as Oak Street goes into Blue Heron and right at that entrance of Blue Heron Park. And that's what these, uh, what the video is showing. Uh, I think that's about it. Um, and I want to acknowledge the artwork. Uh, it's by, the birds are by Aaron Linton. Thank you very much. Next is Christina. And I won't be up here very long. I do want to just say thank you again, um, everyone, for coming. 
and I've had the pleasure of knowing Eugene for a while, and then I've just met Ryan today. So I think this is going to be great for us to learn more about wetlands. I know I don't know much. I was fortunate to take these photos, and then thanks to Wanda for stringing them all together. Um, in addition to, I think, for us to learn about such an important topic, especially in the time of drought and water scarcity and changing climates, I think it's good for us to know about wetlands, right? We probably wouldn't be here today, though, unless we had heard that there was going to be a potential sale. The sale hasn't gone through yet. It was supposed to close on October 29th, I think, and then it's been pushed back. I think Charlotte mentioned it to December 13th. So if the sale doesn't go through, then you know maybe we don't have anything to worry about. But if the sale does go through, and Mr. Beard and company decides to go forward with the development of an upscale, that's his word, upscale RV park, and this is not a mobile home park, this is an RV park, then we heard him in one of the in, in the special meeting that was called in September that um, Mr. Day, Doug Day, who works for James Beard, said clearly on the audio, and you can go back and listen to it, that the wetland would be filled in for the RV park. So that's a concern to me, um, and I, obviously it's a concern to y'all because that's why you're here. So if the sale goes through. And if they decide to fill in the wetland or do something to it, then they're going to start going through what's called the mitigation process. And I'm sure that Ryan and Eugene can tell you a lot more and a lot better. I've had uh, conversations with Laura Brown of the Department of State Lands three times about this. And so if the sale happens, then there has to be a mitigation process go through because they are going to be moving more than five uh, 10 cubic yards, they're going to be moving more than 50 cubic yards of soil to do anything with this wetland. So if they do that, then they have to go to Department of State Lands or they will be illegal. If they do that, then there will, they will have a 30-day review period, and then there will be a 30-day comment period, and that's for us. And then if for some reason they decide, oh yeah, this is the best thing since sliced bread, then there can be a 60-day day appeal period. So we are having this meeting not only to learn about the value of wetlands, but also just be prepared in case the sale goes through. So if you did sign up, then we will be able to keep you apprised of that. Um, so we'll have um, Ryan speak first. And Ryan is with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And you don't look old enough to have done all this stuff. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> you don't have to see it. <laughs> Ryan is a fisheries biologist with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife in the Rogue Watershed District. He has served as the Salmon and Trout Enhancement Program step biologist for the past six years. Prior to that position, Ryan worked for ODFW on the Lower Rogue River and South Coast streams from the Elk and Sixes River near Port Orford, southward, southward to the Chetco and Winchuck Rivers near the Oregon-California border, also in the California Central Valley for the University of California Davis as a staff research associate. Ryan graduated from Humboldt State University in 2007, studying biology, GIS, rugby, and the world-famous Marching Lumberjacks Band. <laughs> Ryan has worked with salmon, steelhead trout, and green sturgeon in his 14-year fisheries career, ranging from leading the rogue's oldest continual fisheries monitoring program, the Huntley Saney project, Saney in Gold Beach, partnering with anglers to collect broomstock for the Chetco Winter Steelhead Hatchery program, and also acoustically tagging and tracking migration of salmon smolts and adult green sturgeon in the Sacramento River and Delta. That sounds so fascinating. As the upper road step biologist, he wears many hats, so to speak. He spearheads fishery enhancement projects in the Grants Pass area, advises landowners on stream stewardship and riparian restoration through Jackson and Josephine County, monitors fish populations in small streams, and brings the wonders of salmon to the classrooms of around 50 teachers and students every fall with the Fish Eggs to Fry Classroom Incubators Program. STEP projects are a great opportunity to get community groups involved with fisheries management in their local watersheds 
and Ryan works with local fishery, fishing guides and conservation groups such as Middle Road Sea Letters, Road Fly Fishers, Southern Oriole Fly Fishers, and Crater Bass Clubs. One of the cornerstone monitoring projects of the road, Upper Road Step is the small stream, urban stream, and intermittent stream programs. Volunteers help Ryan operate fish traps in the winter and spring months to document Chinook, Coho, Steelhead, Speckled Dace, Pacific Lamprey, and even climate small scale sucker usage in often small and overlooked streams of the Rogue Valley. Many of these are likely in your own backyard and community. Thank you for saying that. Ryan lives in Medford with his wife Golden and two year old son Walter. Ryan enjoys time with his family camping, hunting, fishing, and sports, and most recently, all all the DUI, DIY. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. That was, you do a lot. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm a. Uh, I am much better than I was on Monday, I'll say. Uh, I had a kind of crud that was going around for everybody. Not COVID, but <laughs> it's the other thing. As soon as you get your two-year-old in daycare, two-and-a-half-year-old in daycare, that's, uh, that's how it happens. So. so I'm not exactly talking all about wetlands tonight, but I am trying to bring in what we have learned through the small stream, urban stream, and intermittent stream program, specifically in the Phoenix area. Um, Blue Heron Park is a treasure for this area. There's a lot of awesome things. Um, I just think of the cold water input that comes into Bear Creek in the middle of summer, and that really, I mean, this last summer we're trying to get fish out of downtown Medford and move them up into, into Phoenix, Talent, and um, Ashland. And so what you guys do have out here with Blue Heron Park is, um, is I think, worth fighting for. So we'll get, I'm going to give you a few little anecdotes, some tales of the streams in Bear Creek. So this, yep. So this little guy right here. This is not from Bear Creek. This is from uh, Gilbert Creek in downtown Grants Pass. Uh, the shopping cart back there is one of my favorite um, photos. So I'd love to say that I'm here to talk about, hey, more shopping carts equals more steelhood. We have, a lot. We have no shortage of shopping carts in Bear Creek in downtown Medford, but that is not what I'm here to talk about. So I'm here to talk about the state of Jefferson and the fish that call it home and all the small streams um, in between. So here we are, this is the, the wonderful Rogue River watershed. It's a very dynamic basin um, to the south. We have our coastal mountain ranges, or our, our Klamath mountain ranges to the west, our coastal mountain range, and to the east, the Cascade Mountains. It's very flashy. Um, we have, we can have, you know, 60, 70 inches of precipitation over in Cave Junction for the winter, and you'll get over here in, in, uh, in Medford, and we'll see 16, 17, 18 inches. Um, <clears throat> we have, of all the coastal watersheds in the state of Oregon, we have nearly 400,000 people that call the road uh, home. The largest to our north is the Umpqua. Um, they have a, just shy, uh, a little bit over 100,000 folks that live in the, in the Umpqua watershed. So with that, we have large expected uh, population growth over the next, uh, I think by the most recent I saw this was a few years ago was we're expecting I think 40% growth by 2050 in Jackson County um, but when you have all these people living in all this awesome habitat this is also the habitat that critters like steelhead, cutthroat trout, chinook salmon, lamprey, all the other critters that we're going to talk about they also like to live in here so the green is our low gradient habitat and that's really where species like summer steelhead in particular are very vulnerable that's where they live that's where we live and going forward, you guys saw it this year, competition for water. This was the very first year um, that the Klamath Project over on the other side of the mountain did not get uh, water deliveries for the uh, Klamath Basin Farms. Town Irrigation District shut off the beginning of August this year. Honestly, we did not know what to expect when that happened. A lot of our small streams are, con are used as irrigation conveyance. And so essentially they trick fish to hang out in them and then you turn the spigot off and what do these guys do? So we, have, uh, we actually have 11 species of native fish that call the road home. Sometimes I say 14, but that's if you're breaking, if you're a, a splitter, not a lumper. So we have our fall and spring Chinook salmon, our coho salmon, our winter and summer steelhead, resident rainbow trout, steelhead and trout are the same. <clears throat> our coastal cutthroat, and then we have uh, four species of sculpin, Pacific lamprey, three-spined sticklebacks. You don't see those guys up here too much. They are more uh, in the lower watershed, climate small scale suckers, speckled dace, and the two species of green sturgeon. I'm a sturgeon guy. The rogue's awesome. We have the 
one of three spawning populations of green sturgeon that hang out in the road. If you want to talk more about sturgeon, I'd love to talk with you about it. <laughs> but these guys, I mean, they'll go all the way up to the Columbia River and then come back to the road. So We've got amicetes. So amicetes are juvenile lamprey. Um, just recently, I believe, uh, uh, Ian Reed documented, he's a local am uh, lamprey expert, actually found Pacific lamprey amicetes in, I think, just south of Ashland. Uh, up around Oak Street. Mm -hmm. so Bear Creek's got some of the lowest densities of amicetes and lamprey that he's seen on the, um, in all of his surveys, but we've got him in Bear Creek. That's pretty cool. This is a few years ago, Pete Sammer and myself, in Lower um, Dean and Griffin Creek. This was in 2017, I think, when we were here, but these guys live four or five years in fresh water. They bury themselves um, in this fine sediment, and this lower section of these creeks and Lower Bear Creek was a pretty hostile place in the last multi-year drought that we had in 1516. These guys were still buried down in that sediment and they survived. Pretty cool when we saw that. Here's our clown of small scale suckers. Um, we have an awesome little population of these guys that we figured out um, hang out in Lazy Creek. So Lazy Creek's a little urban stream that comes into downtown Medford by the BMX uh, park and skate, skate park and um, mm -hmm. Little Bear Creek. Um, Pretty cool, we did not know we had a spawning population of suckers, poop traps, and volunteers helped make that happen. We have our 11 native species, but we have 21 um, to date, and there might be something on that I'm missing. Um, I don't see uh, uh, <coughs> stripers. We do get striped bass in the room periodically. We'll catch that down at Huntley Park at the sanding project. But the two big ones, which are essentially ubiquitous in the watershed now, are First is the red side shiner. This is a native species that, that to uh, Western Oregon, but of uh, all the reports that we can see going back to the 30s and 40s, we don't see any mention of red side shiners. Come the mid 1950s, they were introduced into the, into the basin. About 20 years later, the Umpqua pike minnow, same kind of distribution. It was introduced in the Middle Road um, in a farm pond. We found out about it in 1977-ish. Um, and by 78, they were in the main stem. They'd come out of a farm pond, an unscreened farm pond in the Wolf Creek Basin. So pretty makes sense, came over from the Umpqua. But they are now essentially ubiquitous throughout the watershed. And I'm gonna get into that in two slides, why that is kind of important. So with all this development, our native fish, they've evolved to move around a lot, if we let them. So this right here, <coughs> This is the uh, Grand Street Dam in Ashland. That's the summer steel of trying to get up. We're doing a really good job of, of blocking fish. And Cole Rivers, he was an actual person. Um, we have a hatchery named after him. Um, it's at the base of Lost Creek Lake. But he was, uh, by 1940, he said there was hundreds of dams in the road. Um, we still find hundreds of, we find derelict dams every year, actually. Um, things that have been covered up, you know. After these burn, it was kind of cool. Like, oh, there's something. We should probably try to move that. We often think about what is good past or what is good fish habitat. This gentleman right here took this photo. Um, this is uh, a juvenile steelhead trying to get into Lazy Creek in downtown Medford. You always think about big fish ladders as that's the way to get fish moving um, for adults. But what we don't think about is these small streams, and that's where these little guys really like to come in in the winter months and hang out. And what keeps that keeps them alive in the summer? Um, this goes back to grade school. Fish need clean, cold water. They need, and what makes that? Riparian shade. Mm -hmm. What we don't always talk about is what is cool about Blue Heron Park, and that's some of the springs and wetlands. So here's a canopy assessment of the Bear Creek uh, Basin. This is old, this is from 2005. Obviously it doesn't have the massive Almeda fire burn. But for the most part, you can see in the, in the highly populated areas, that's where the riparian canopy is lacking. Um, Low is yellow all along the I-5 corridor. As you get into Phoenix and Talent, we used to say, hey, that's actually some pretty good riparian habitat. You get down into Medford and Central Point, and it's just pretty denuded. Um, one of the things our department has been advocating for is the, is the retention of some of the larger standing dead snags, as that is, we, we are hopeful that that can help. Um, eventually, those are going to fall into Bear Creek. Um, you know, we had a lot of lot of it getting cut off the off the um, the bikeways and, and from potentially falling onto I five. But we are wanting to see that standing dead wood um, stay put. 
that also helps in the succession of, of new species because it gets hot here in the summer. So here's our temp. Uh, uh, this is rough. I grabbed this. I had this from, I think, Brian Barr in like 2016. Um, but it was a good slide, so I threw it in here. Um, so this is just, this is rough data of temperature, essentially. Here's your talent and Ashland. Green is good as you get down into Phoenix, orange, and then you get down into Medford, red. Um, we had uh, a few days in downtown uh, Central Point this year that uh, Bear Creek was in the high 80s, if not 90s. And we were like, was that, was that temperature logger out of water? Was it not? Um, the fish that live down there in this reach, they're trying to find cold water inputs. They're trying to find little tributaries that come in or things that we don't even know is a tributary that might be just a natural spring. But when you have these warm water and you also have this non-native species in, or non-local species, shiners and pike minnow, they do really well in degraded stream habitats. Um, shiners in particular will outcompete juvenile steelhead when water temperatures are warm and they fight for the best available habitat in the pools. They're just kind of bullies. Um, this is a real quick graphic. It's a little kind of busy, um, but Payne Creek is what I highlighted here. This is the creek that's in your guys' neck of the woods here. There's really nothing at this point that I think is going to be done about Payne Creek, but it's just it's shown you that this was development unchecked historically. There's two miles of habitat on Payne Creek that has been cut off. Essentially right there at the truck stop in the frontage road, um, Payne Creek goes off to the northeast of Bear Creek, goes under the clover leaf, and then runs under the truck stop um, and the Peterbilt uh, um, place over there. What a crappy story, man. That's just, it's really unfortunate because you look at this and we have all these berries. These are complete berries. We have some berries that are just partial, but we estimate about 800 steelhead at least could be produced in just the 24 miles um, completely blocked. That's just a rough estimate. That's assuming a 2% survival, which given ocean conditions some years could be much less than that. Here's Paint Creek I'm talking about. Here, blue herons down here. <clears throat> We've got a tenth of a mile of habitat on Payne Creek, and then it runs under under I-5, um, <coughs> but then there's a many thousand foot, about 1,500 foot culvert. Here's Coleman Creek. This is in our backyard just to the north of us. I was actually really surprised that Coleman Creek, the small stream uh, project, actually found juvenile steelhead. We caught four steelhead in like 2000 and that was like 2007 or 2008. Um, actually, it might have been 2011. That was a high water year. Uh, but we found two and a half, sorry, two miles upstream. But there's four barriers on Coleman Creek that are really hindrances, especially for juvenile fish. Here's here's uh, 0.4 miles right upstream. This is just by the Jack in the Box and the Thai Food Place and uh, and um, Park Rose. That's essentially the 99 culvert. Um, just upstream of that is this guy. This is one of our two irrigation crossings. Um, and this is the furthest upstream irrigation crossing, and then another one of those is a road. But this uh, wind is in the works because of the fires and the opportunity that it, um, ODOT sped this up. So the Department of Transportation, this is the culvert that I'm talking about on Coleman Creek. This is supposed to be being replaced um, within the next year or two. Anderson Creek. Got five and a half miles of habitat on Anderson Creek, but there's stuff that volunteers do with me. So we've got uh, this cool little wooden fish ladder that is um, essentially two tenths of a mile up from its mouth with Bear Creek. Especially in, with climate change, these low flow um, conditions that we're seeing into the, um, in the into the winter months. This little two foot jump is actually a barrier for a little guy. Um, you know, you'll have a big, nice high water that'll bring some fish in there, but they want to get in there now. Um, we did a little improvements to it. But here's the uh, Creekside Estates, prior to it burning down in the Elmo fire. My mom lived right over there. Um, the residents of this park were just stoked to learn that they had juvenile steelhead using um, uh, Anderson Creek there. So here's the uh, before and after. I mean, these aren't huge sample sizes by any means, but these are very inefficient traps. So one steelhead in 2019, we did not have the fish ladder. 2020 and 2021, 2021 being a drought year, but we've got 24 fish in there in those two years. I could go in there with a shocker and probably tell you the exact same thing. Um, 
<clears throat> just some observations. Anderson Creek. We got steelhead spawning up by the the Baptist Church there by 99, and then you go a little further up. There's a private culvert. That's what it looks like. There's some issues. The lower Anderson Creek right now, the Rogue Watershed Council, um, and I think the Phoenix. Uh, I know Stuart Warren was was trying to lead some of this. They're replanting that, and this is one of my favorite little creeks. This is the my. Uh, there's some cynical folks in my office. They call this Dan's Ditch. This is here. We're starting to get closer to the park, okay? So this is a little spring that originates under the Phoenix Municipal Yard. Trickles out through this guy's field. I've been up here. Haven't found any fish. <coughs> Cruises on down. We found fish up in the mobile home park here. Or in, in the, in the, that's not mobile home, in that residential neighborhood. Um, but essentially then it goes through the side of the creek side. Right now, where the the cement um, company was, there was like a. Essentially, it's it actually, yep. Okay, that goes. That's right. Um, it's just innocuous, and you don't even think about it. It's cruising through this little neighborhood, and I mean, this is what we see every winter. Wow. You can you can go in there just below a small little pool and net those guys out of there. These are all juvenile steelhead. I have netted juvenile um, chinook out of there. We partnered with the uh, Phoenix High School a few years ago. This was it um, on year two after we cleared the, you know, ten, ten feet of blackberries that had grown in. Year three on the left. Year five, we had an inmate crew come in and we further got rid of blackberries around um, this small tributary. The day I was going back to see my mom's house, it had burned. I had to walk by the thing and I was like, hey. <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of these guys did end up dying. Um, yeah. But, I mean, what I think uh, John Spies, who you guys asked to come and talk, one of the things he was kind of pointing out is that a lot of, there wasn't as much 100% stand mortality in this area because there had been some fuels treatments about the, the blackberries, and they'd gone in and strategically tried to uh, remove some of those. Um, I personally can't say I'm super happy with what I'm seeing uh, currently. There, there's just more of a, let's go in there and bulldoze everything mm -hmm. um, in areas that did not burn, but... We do have to start tackling these non-native um, uh, vegetation of the area. And here we are. So this is your guys' spring. We're getting there. Um, this little spring in here, actually, after this burned, it was like, man, there's so many little seeps and tributaries and stuff coming out in this area. No wonder, um, you know, we, we when you look at that first graph, it's warm in the summer, but it doesn't take into account you have all these little micro refugia. So this is uh, the site of the urban or the uh, Phoenix Center. This is what it used to look like as a fish guy. I was actually kind of bummed out when they said they're going to turn this into a wetland. I was like, man, there's there's steelhead using this. So we got a nice uh, urban steelhead front page of the Tribune. What year was that? And that was 2015, I think. Mm. And <clears throat> now we have a busy, busy little beaver that has taken over. <laughs> um, of course, the city of Phoenix was like, hey, we. We can't have this. It's like, well, you guys turned this into a wetland now. You got some credits or something. And now it's being used as a wetland. So let it let it be a wetland. And DSL actually got involved and said, you know what? We actually have regulatory authority over beavers. And you can't just take the beaver dam out of there. So a uh, local guy by the name of Jacob Shockey, he was just featured in Oregon field guide. Good plug for Jacob. Um, I think it aired like three or four weeks ago, but he there's now a little um, pipe there. So Where the Beaver Dam's not super huge. This is right next to the Phoenix, uh, the Phoenix Civic Center or the Community Center. That's on between first and second. You said there's a little there. There's a, he's now got a, a pond leveler essentially. Oh. It's ways that we can live with beaver, have beavers, and uh, not have them just get you know taken out. So, but where this thing comes out is still a pretty valuable habitat. And I, I on a big high water year, I could see, um, you know, a lot of folks think beaver dams is like, there's different things, beaver dams versus like a concrete dam. I have seen water flowing down this side mm -hmm. channel, so this can get into there. And the cool thing about this is I think it does hold some of that water during the summer and um, continue to let it out. Not sure what the temperature is, that's my only concern. More little, this is where it comes out on the bicycle path. I've had juvenile coho using that, um, juvenile steelhead totally. 
Chinook. Um, this is some temperature data. This is uh, real data that I took with the Phoenix High School kids um, in 2016, back when I really was like, ooh, let's, you know, let's do some science, guys. Um, <laughs> we deployed some temperature loggers, and the little blue line here is the that unnamed tributary that we showed with all the fish in the net. Um, we're pushing, you know, on average, at least three, um, actually like about five degrees less. In the, the upper graph is the maximum daily temperature, the seven-day maximum, and then the bottom is the seven-day average. But consistently, that little tributary was a lot cooler. It does not surprise me that Anderson Creek is up here. Anderson is just more irrigation water that's going down in the summer. But... I wish I was seeing this. This is all juvenile coho. This is actually from Hawk Creek. That's from this summer. Um, my colleague at the BLM took that. Those are all juvenile coho. They were they were snorkeling through this reach, and it was like bath water. <clears throat> and then as soon as they hit this little tiny, they got over the side. They like started getting cold, and then suddenly they're like, "Hey, all we weren't seeing fish where we would normally think we would, but they're all tucked up on there by the bank, hanging out in that cold water to survive the summer." But this is from this summer. This is from July. Um, pretty much right where the wetland actually does come out, the, the hyperetic flow, so the underground flow that meets Bear Creek. This guy is a ju this is an adult summer steelhead. Um, had already spawned more than likely, and he was just hanging out, trying to seek some refuge. It was cold water coming out of this little spring, and he was hanging out there so he didn't have to make the whole trip down the rest of Berry Creek. So here's our wetland. This orange line over here. So historically, um, after the burn, I was talking with, I think, Jerry Boat from ODOT, and he was talking about this uh, this burn that essentially was put in, I think, in the 50s or 60s, whenever 99 was built. So this burn, it cut off. Originally, I think, and this is where Eugene and I were talking, um, I think that this little wetland probably flew, flowed under here, but when you walk the bike path, you definitely notice there's this little tributary over here, and you'll see it definitely this winter. Um, otherwise, just go traipse around there, you'll see this. And I've always walked by, I'm like, I would love to see even this little tenth of a mile section having juvenile fish using it. Because it's, you know, Bear Creek is an urban stream. It's very flashy. You get a little bit of rain, and downtown Medford shoots up to like 250 cubic feet per second in like a half an hour. It's classic urban stream syndrome, but you have these valuable little off-channel habitats that juvenile fish can hang out. And in the summer, if they could access that and get access to that cold water coming from that spring, that would be very, very valuable. We don't destroy habitat like we used to. I don't have uh, um, any better pictures other than this. This is one of the reasons that we live here, I think. We don't want to see, um, you know, there's plenty of examples of development gone unchecked with zero environmental regulation. This is the LA River. <coughs> Goal is to not turn that. When I when I go out on calls and I talk to some real old timers and they just hate Californians, man. They just got me. And I'm like, well, do you guys want to see what you're doing turn into California? Oh, heck no, man. <laughs> so I try and remind them that what they're doing is, is not not good for the, the streams of the road. But I do honestly believe that Bear Creek's worst days are behind it. Um, this is. This is uh, my my uh, my boss Dan Van Dyke. He likes to get out in the field every now and then, and he'll go out uh, into Lower Bear Creek because we do have some historical data on Lower Bear Creek below Pine Street, below Central Point. Um, and back in 1991, uh, the last time we had a, a very significant multi-year drought and El Nino, um, they were doing surveys in Lower Bear Creek. Found no juvenile coho, no juvenile Chinook salmon. Nothing but non-native red side shiners, um, pretty much from the mouth of Bear Creek all the way up to Wagner Creek in Talent. Bear Creek's in some pretty bad shape if you're only finding shiners up to Talent. Um, black crappie, raw sewage smell. There's parts of Bear Creek you can go and get some raw sewage smell. Absolutely, I won't argue with that. This year they did not see any of that kind of stuff. They did not see crappies. We did not see um, carp breaching in Lower mm -hmm. Bear Creek sign of very high water quality. You've got carp running everywhere. Um, but the cool thing is we did find juvenile um, Chinook from pretty much Medford Irrigation Dam all the way up to Talent. Um, that, so that encompasses the Phoenix area. And we also found um, 
juvenile, uh, well, non-native red side shiners are only dominant in two of the five sites that they, they were looking at. Um, and the cool thing in that lower section is we were finding juvenile steelhead. And so they were hanging out with the, the cold water, the one cold water um, stream that comes in there. And it's not even that cold. It's like 67 degrees while Bear Creek was like 80 um, on the day that they, uh, they sampled it. I'll, I'll wrap up. I know I've been talking way too long. So um, this is old data, but this is from 2008. So we actually commissioned an economic. Um, you know, a lot of times you talk to folks and I say, hey, you know, we want to we want to uh, save this little wetland over here. We want to, you know, improve this creek. Sometimes you need to put it in dollars and cents. Um, here's the uh, here's the, the southern. Um, so this is southern Oregon. Essentially, it takes into uh, account wildlife viewing, fishing, hunting, and shell fishing. I'm a fishing guy. I'm a you know I like to hunt, but honestly, our biggest contributions to um, economic expenditures in the area is the wildlife viewing, um, and that's something where we we realize that, and we're trying to push much more non-game, um, you know, not your traditional. They're trying to diversify essentially our user, um, so it, it it plays a big a big role. And so put it in. This was the last time I did this was in 2016, but. 61 million in 2016 dollars is what hunting, fishing, wildlife viewing, and it's mostly you know activities on the road. But you know, the fish especially find their way in all of our other tributaries that, that attach to uh, to the rogue system. Jackson County a lot bigger than Josephine County, but um, it has, it does add up. And that, this is you know folks coming to the area to go and ride on a, a boat ride. This is coming and and you know. <clears throat> going to the Shakespeare Festival and then while they're here they might, you know, hire Scott over here to take them fishing. So so what you guys can do, I think getting involved and commenting and attending public meetings is a huge thing. Uh, way too often there's not anybody uh, showing up to actually give their two cents. And so things just get passed quite quickly. We actually have a lot of environmental ordinances on the books already. They just don't always get enforced. Um, you can also strengthen your ordinances. Up until a few years ago, we had a lot of uh, local cities that didn't even have um, riparian ordinances, so protection of riparian vegetation along uh, creeks. Um, Shady Cove and Gold, uh, Gold Hill are, are two, of the, two of the cities that <coughs> up until recently did not have it. A lot of times, smaller cities will use the larger, like Jackson County's ordinance. Um, so Jackson County, just FYI, it's 50 feet, regardless of fish in it or not, 50 feet of uh, vegetation past the creeks, top of bank, is supposed to be protected. If you're going to remove that, <clears throat> you're supposed to only really remove native veget or non-native vegetation, and you're also supposed to mitigate for that. So a lot of times, obviously, if you go look around, um, that is not necessarily the case. Other than that, come out with me, get involved, do what you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> You're optimistic. That was great, Ryan. I've got some questions for you, so I hope everybody else is making notes.
Be here. I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you guys a little bit about the values around some wetland habitat. I will lead by saying I'm not a wetland specialist by any measure. There are folks out there who make their living. Uh, wetlands are so complex and so valuable in terms of the services, the ecosystem services they provide. There are people like me who do nothing but work on wetlands. And so I am lucky enough to do riparian restoration in this area, which has me working on replanting trees and, and streamside vegetation. Our organization is really focused on doing that work to mitigate temperature impact so we can maintain cold water for our native aquatic species as well as for water quality because you know, it's not just the salmon and steelhead that rely on this cold, clean water and it's cold and clean. We rely on it, we drink it, we use it on our farms, and so it's important for us for a lot of reasons, not just for fish. Wetlands are a big piece of that. I'm, uh, I don't specifically do my work on wetlands, but in the course of uh, doing restoration in this area, in Bear Creek and the Rogue in general, I'm in interacting with these wetland features all the time. And so I actually, by default, end up restoring some of these places and working in them a bit. I've learned a bit about them and some of the things that they, the services that they provide, and so I'll try to share that with you. Hopefully we can just get into a good interactive conversation here very long, so I won't talk at you for, for too long here.
Most times of year, but in, a, in winter or higher times of water, those wetlands fill up. They're sort of recharging the well, water table. They're also connected to it. A lot of the wetlands I work with are this area here, the sort of overflow wetland that happens in the floodplain on either side of the creek. Those are the places where we're planting trees and restoring vegetation to protect the stream, reduce erosion, and create shade and cover. But these areas are oftentimes especially in, in this day and age with low stream flows in the summer, part of what sustains these areas is actually this water table that's coming down the slope here. And this is kind of where we get into the seepage wetland. And that's what I think we're sort of talking about here in Phoenix. We basically got a water table come down and hits a, a hard rock layer underneath Phoenix, it's sort of a bedrock layer, and it emerges. And that series of emergence happens like Brian showed you on that slide. It happens along this whole section of Phoenix. There's rock here and there's water seeping out across from that. It's creating a whole bunch of pockets of cold water. Some of those areas are closer to the stream, some of them are further back. Our development over time has pushed the stream corridor in. There's a lot of fill we've encroached into the floodplain. So what was more extent in the past has now been sort of pushed up there a bit closer. So this is just, you know, kind of give you an idea high functioning versus lower functioning. There's a lot that goes into this, it's very simplified, but I tend to think of a higher functioning wetland or an opportunity to restore one as one that's, you know, hydrologically connected. It's still got, it, it possesses a connection to another water body, which, you know, gives a more dynamic connection to the environment. Um, it's better for wildlife in terms of moving through. Um, a wetland should be dominated by native plants. You know, we, we don't get the wetland value and function when it's dominated by invasive plants. So a wetland covered in blackberry is not performing the same. It may be performing some functions, but it's not performing anywhere close to the functions that uh, a wetland native vegetation could. Um, and you know, that also gets at that complex structure. So if you have mostly invasives, you're gonna have pretty much uh, kind of a, a very non-complex structure usually, and oftentimes there's not much light reaching underneath them, so there's not a lot of production happening. So that's kind of your scenario here, what you guys are used to seeing along a lot of the Bear Creek Corridor, free fire. You know, we kind of have an opportunity to, to jump ahead in time and, and get past a lot of that if we act quickly post-fire. The fire is really an opportunity for us. So folks like myself are out there trying to make sure it doesn't ever turn back into what it was, a giant morass of uh, invasive weeds. So I threw some slides in here that I just pulled from Google Earth. This was, I was basically going through and just trying to make sense of what happened to this area. And obviously, it would be nice if we could go back to the 1939 aerials, which I don't have access to, but they are out there. 
And, you know, sometimes it can be really interesting to go back and look at how the floodplain has been converted. One landowner I worked with on a project on the road you know, has a giant pond on his property. And he showed me the 39 aerial of it, and it was a giant side channel of the Rogue River. Mm-hmm. And it's like, wow, you know, you just, a lot has changed. We've changed the landscape a lot. The furthest I was able to go back and get an even reasonably clean image was this 1994 shot. But in this picture, you can kind of see that this is this is actually just a, a road superimposed by Google Earth, but there isn't really a road here yet. There's more of a farm track. There is probably already been some fill placed in here that kind of disconnected this section from the wetland that we're talking about from this bigger inset that Brian kind of talked about. It's like a, a, a fill layer came through here and kind of possibly disconnected that. There's also Blue Heron Park really hasn't been developed at that point. Jump ahead, you can see some additional development that's gone in here up to the year 2000. Um, still, this road hasn't really been developed, but it's very clear that there's a different, you know, that different gradient of, of uh, moisture going on here, right? That connection has essentially been broken from the floodplain in that stretch. So then you go ahead and fully develop it and put in a road and a hardened surface, basically kind of surrounded this low floodplain inset here that was probably once connected here is now uh, disconnected, but there is still a hydrologic connection to that area. So that cold water is still making it into there. So that's that's valuable. At least we're, we haven't lost that cold water input. We, we may have broken the connection a little bit so that flood waters have uh, less likelihood of sort of using that area to settle. Um, but you can see that even in a dry time of year when everything else is pretty much drying out, this, this wetland had good water in it. It's dominated by blackberries, but it's plenty green. Fast forward again, 2017, you know, the extent of the blackberry seems to have increased a little bit. But again, it's suggesting there's a, there's a decent water source in that pocket year round and that there's, there is some wetland function happening there. It's really too bad about that big, and that willow's non-native, mm-hmm. but it was a beautiful old tree. Yeah. I, I thought it would come back after the fire. I honestly thought mm-hmm. it had a decent chance. I'm kind of surprised that it hasn't be a bigger, bigger go of it. But that, you know, we all saw the blackberry in the fire made a huge difference in terms of damage to trees. Where blackberry had been controlled, like in our project area, the fire dropped to the ground, passed through, and was actually restorative. Like the shrubs and the trees re-sprouted we didn't lose the, cra- the canopy, and so new seed rained ra- down right after the fire, and we pretty much were able to jumpstart. Where blackberry was dominant, it really really had an effect on killing the trees. And I think that's something that we have to be conscious of, not just in riparian corridors, but when we're thinking about our wetlands too. When we allow them to get taken over like this, we lose the function you know, while they're taken over, and then we basically take them to a full reset when there's a, a disturbance event. Post fire, you can see there's definitely some green down in there. It didn't take long. I mean, the fire hadn't hardly gone out and things started to green up around the edge of those little water sources. That's kind of the very bottom pools of, of this wetland. I was also able to pull a couple of pre-fire images off the street view. And just to give you a sense of you know what this spot looked like, it did have a few trees. The park is very manicured around the edges of this property. and. Actually, right up to the edge of the wetland, there's plantings along the upper slope. But the wetland itself was not in really good functioning condition. It may have been producing water, but it was mostly <coughs> in the blackberry. And I like this, this view in particular because you can get a sense of the swale. So, you know, this may be a slug of fill in here that, that sort of broke what was a connection through here where it was more low, low, level grade or even sloping down. But this swale still comes down towards the park and towards the floodplain. So there is still some potential in a big flood, like in 96, 97, that water could go back in and inundate this. It could settle in there. It could actually become a, uh, a place where that water could sump in a little bit. Hopefully there's a way for fish to escape if that does happen. <laughs> we'll be here from Dan. Um, but I, I think when you look at this, it, to me, it, it sort of suggests, well, this wetland may have been altered and may have been low functioning before, but what is the potential here still? There's a lot of potential for this to, particularly as it gets down closer to the park, to be 
something that could be a valuable asset to the park. You know, Ryan touched on watchable wildlife. It's a big thing. People want to see animals. And when you go to, to the park, there's a lot of neat habitats, but pocket wetlands that you can look over are not one of them, really. There's not a lot of that type of habitat there. Um, there's a lot of good riparian floodplain habitat. Looking from the top here, I mean, you can see that, you know, this was kind of where the house was. This area may have been excavated, manipulated by people. Perhaps they were digging down into, into a spring or just working on building the footings of their house. There's an interesting rock wall under there that you guys may have seen. Some of you can look at this closely. It, to me, it suggests that maybe that area was dug out at one time and, and a structure built over it, perhaps for either cooling purposes or they were actually using the spring as their water source for the domestic home. So. And that house was built in 1920. That's what I understand. It was there since 1920. So yeah, and there was some love put into that area, the rock walls. Yeah, it almost looks like there used to be a garden there, like yeah. a vegetable garden or something at one time because the soil sort of mounded in the middle. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I think it's a it's been manipulated, so it suggests to me that it's not a pristine wetland, but it's it's a wetland that could be it has all the features to be a functional and valuable wetland habitat. So, mm -hmm. you know, it gives us a chance to kind of imagine maybe there is a, some sort of compromise between development and, and maintaining this habitat. At the very least, we might have an opportunity to reshape this into something better that could be more functional in the future. I threw this slide in because, while to me this is not ideal from the perspective that it is surrounded by a built environment, right? And so it's disconnected, like, like our little wetland here has built environment that's been wrapped around it makes it a little bit tougher for wildlife. You think about sort of sink and source areas, like you want wildlife, you don't want wildlife to be attracted into somewhere where they're gonna then get run over on the road. Um, you don't want to draw birds and you know insects and stuff across the highway with, a, with an attractant. I mean, ODOT's kind of found this, they were building wetlands in the middle of these interchanges and stuff, and, and then they have a lot of death of wildlife because they're attracting them into these places where it's not really a good spot for them. So it's something to think about. But the advantage here is that, well, if you are going to have built environment and you can maintain, like plant a good diverse array of vegetation, create a high functioning pocket of wetland, well, it's not only beneficial to, I mean, it's still beneficial to the water, it's still filtering water, it's still providing a lot of the conversion, it's, it's primary production area, so it's providing some forage for birds and insects, things like that. It might not be accessible to fish, but there's some good values there. It's also providing value to humans. You know, the reality is we need to see water. This is part of why we need to restore the Bear Creek Greenway in Phoenix to a high functioning state. Because people need a place to go to be close to water. I mean, you guys have all felt it. Like, long day, you want to go for a walk, you go down to the creek, you look at the creek for a few minutes, pretty soon you're like, oh, I'm feeling all right. <laughs> Not everybody can, you know, drive to the Rogue River or Crater Lake, take a, a float trip or a jet boat trip. Yeah. This is the water that we have. Mm -hmm. I own a house outside of Phoenix here. This is the water we have close to home. So it's important. Like, even wetlands can be very rejuvenative for people. There's a reason we need to have them, not just the ecosystem services. So sometimes a compromise between built environment and maintaining the wetland you know, like this could be really uh, good for us in lots of ways. Sometimes when it's sit into something that we have to care for, we care for it more. When it's off over on the side, it's easier to ignore. So in a way, by bringing in, kind of circling in with our community around these green spaces, wetlands, and these features, we actually adopt them and, and tend to steward them more and care more about them. So that's something to think about in terms of balancing totally natural with, with human environment. I mean, worst case scenario, the environment encroaches so much to where it's just, you know, built all around. There's still a lot of value in having this little pocket of wetland habitat, you know. There's somebody who's looking at it and going, oh, this is pretty cool. They're relaxing for a few minutes. There's still things happening here. There's still insects in the water, plants casting seeds. So it's, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing in, in my mind. We want to preserve every pocket of water we can. But we don't want to let them go back to something like this that's just choked in with weeds and stuff. So it's not enough to just say, we're going to save it. We have to save it and then own it. 
You know, you got to take it in and say, all right, it's not just like protected from this one, you know, thing. We've got to actually like protect it in the long run by caring for it and, and figuring out a long-term strategy to keep it from turning back into something that's more of a, a liability than an asset for us. Here's some of the things that my thoughts kind of in closing. You know, stormwater, urban runoff, I'm not sure if this wetland accepts much of that at this point. It, it you know, potentially could. When we think about our community continuing to grow, we're going to need wetlands to process this runoff from our built environment before it gets into the creek. Otherwise, we're going to really go backwards with our water quality in Bear Creek. Part of the reason it's been improving is because there's been a lot of those types of features developed. Everything from, you know, taking the downspouts off the viaduct and putting those into swales so that they don't go straight into the creek to having code that requires on-site on stormwater retention was all new development. So there's a lot of things we're doing that's actually a big part of the water quality improvement story for Bear Creek. Um, contribution to late season flows, Ryan kind of touched on that. Creeks are getting lower, getting hotter. Every little pocket of cool water that we have, this doesn't come from an irrigation district or isn't something that can be turned on and turned off is a lifeline for fish. I've seen it a lot of times too, where you find adult fish and juvenile fish just sitting on these little pockets of cold water, breathing hard, and they can actually survive like that. They can shoot into marginal water, do some foraging, come back as long as they've got that place to go and kind of take refuge. So I just want to let you know it's empty. Yep, okay. Uh, nesting and foraging habitat, pollinator habitat, Yay. education. I mean, there's others, and maybe we can talk about that. So, uh, but, but but again, we need to have a plan. We need to know how we're going to fund this. We're going to maintain it. Um, agreements to support that ownership. So let's think about that as we think about not just saving this place, but making it something that stays viable for the future. So. This, this presentation, Christina has it. I don't know if it'll be posted somewhere, but I did put some links in here that you can use if you want to explore some of the information that um, I found with easy searches that's related to wetland function. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone want to ask a question? Mr. English, would you like to say something? I think it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, I did some of the preliminary work on, on getting this wetland classified as jurisdictional. went through a very, you know, kind of a pretty involved process to do that with the Department of State Lands and the Corps of Engineers. Um, but at any rate, I just see a lot of potential for this, this wetland. What I've been listening to, you know, from, from Ryan and Gene is um, it has a lot of value to not just fish, but for what but for wetland values for filtration for providing cold water for wildlife habitat a lot of different things but what i see here is you've got a unique opportunity both biologically and from a community perspective to try and work out something with this person or this organization that's trying to develop for a park you know it should be a mobile home park not for a natural history park um, RV park. Or RV park. So I really do see there's a lot of potential here. Um, be happy to, you know, if there's a little core group here to try and work on some ideas, I'd be happy to work with them. Um, because I do see it's it's valuable for a lot of reasons. I think there's a lot of potential for, as you pointing out, some ways for restoration. It's a, it's a diamond in the rough. You've got the, the major source of water is what drives that wetland. And you've got a very unique source of water. And that water, if managed correctly, can provide you know a wonderful wetland. It's it's, it's got some problems, but it's it's not uh, it's not terrible. You know, it's, it's doable. Right. But I see the way to to make this happen is to find out. For example, if you said to the to this developer, what is it going to cost you to do the permitting, to do the design, to fill that wetland in, even if it's permitted? Why not just let this group have this particular piece of property and let them take it from there and develop it as a wonderful source of you know community pride and a wonderful wetland. And I think that if you present those options, you certainly have 
a lot of interest in the community to do this. Yeah, this is great. And I think if this, if this person as developer has an idea of you know getting some good public relations, doing the right thing in the community, this would be a great opportunity for them as well. I agree with you. Thank yeah. you. We appreciate it. Yeah. Anyone else have a question or want to say something? I have a question. So where is the actual source of this water is? Like, you could see it um, before the fire, and then you could certainly see it after the fire. There was, it looked like a little spring or a little seep coming out right there at the corner of the house. I guess it would be the south side of the house. Um, but I was wondering, is it really a spring? Or you were just talking, Eugene, maybe it's a truncated you know, it should it should go much further up the hill, so to speak, and now it's just coming out of the ground right there, and it's not really a spring per se. I, you know, I don't know. I, I that was part of my why I went back and was kind of using Google Earth. I was trying to figure out if like upstream here, mm -hmm. if there were potentially hydraulic connections. I, you know, and we don't really know. I, I mean, I didn't do enough investigation myself to see what truly is under the house if it's if the water is just coming from the ground there or if it's actually coming out of some sort of structure under there but having when I did work for RV Cog one of the things we did was try to investigate storm drain connections and we'd have these storm drains that flow in the Bear Creek that would provide cold water year round and we'd go well it's coming from somewhere we got to figure out and a lot of times we found that there were just springs that during development you know like underneath the Medford Courthouse there's a huge spring under there and it just it's puking out a lot of water but it's in pipes all the way under the city until it reaches Bear Creek so could this wetland be fed by something you know coming down there possibly but the evidence that there's so many other wetlands mm -hmm. along the same line basically along the whole front of Phoenix and, and seeps and actually some of them are pretty substantial in the amount of water they produce um, it indicates to me that it's probably more geologic that there's water coming down, it's just perching on a hard rock layer, and that's where it's emerging. Now, historically, someone may have dug down to access it, but it may have already just it been there naturally, and they just worked with it too. So, yeah. I mean, the bottom line is we've got a year round perennial cold water source there. It may not be putting out a lot of volume, but it's important because every little drop counts in mid Bear Creek, like you heard from Ryan. That's cool. Um, and then, would it be possible if something changed um, because I thought the water went from the spring down Bear Creek that way but you were just saying that it went more it north. North, north but yeah, there's a north culvert west. that goes under and Wanda went and took a photo or yeah. a video of that yeah there's an overflow call where you can kind of almost see the green uh -huh. it's somewhere in here yep. uh, we did this planting project when I worked for RV Cog and those trees you know you guys probably knew a lot of them have gotten pretty big before the fire and the blackberry really hadn't had a chance to come back with a lot of vigor there so i'm kind of surprised that those trees took it as hard as they did to me it suggested the that the importance is you need to have extent like it's not enough to just have one little patch of restored environment you need to have the bigger it is the more durable it is so a small place like that if blackberry was burning to the side over here just the heat was too much needed to be more extent but any, anyway I after the fire I worked with volunteers to seed and and straw mulch this whole area down here by uh, Lou Heron and I was in that pocket quite a bit in fact we found a handgun in there one of the guys that was the kids that was cleaning up was like what do I do with this <laughs> <laughs> we called the cops and they, they came right down they knew all about it they're like oh yeah we chased the guy in here with that thing wow. so anyway it's a it was a swamp in there and there there's <laughs> several channels in there and it's definitely perennial water so it suggests a connection here it's also connected to whatever water is emerging over here that's kind of feeding those beaver wetlands and stuff as well so so if, but the culvert that goes the culvert that goes into bear creek that way like could that be opened up and could fish actually come back up into there into well, i think that culvert is designed to be the overflow like it kind of there's almost like a secondary berm you can oh, kind of see, see it in that one picture that I had of the base of the um, wetland. You can right, see there's almost exactly. like a sub berm here. Correct. So it's kind of designed to stop in case it fills up that it can't just completely spill out with velocity this way. And this this is one, one of the things that we're, um, I mean, you, we're, we're trying to push some best management practices for, for uh, stormwater swells or bottom swells. Um, 
not getting a whole lot of traction with some of the the county and city um, planning boards but uh, um, you know right now you have uh, it, all new development has to have a, a stormwater detention on site what is most often the case is they're they're uh, essentially encroaching then within the 50 foot um, protection setback the repairing setback and saying hey this is this is now our stormwater swell in here we just had a, a major one built up on Larson Creek actually above North Phoenix Road um, I mean it it's great to have the stormwater detention but you're right next to the creek and and they're are easily easily ways for fish to get in there and then as that water recedes them get trapped in there so um yeah it's like sometimes we might not it depends on how it's designed so yeah and those features are more beneficial the further back in the floodplain they are because yeah. again you know like you get back to it's the drier transition that's where sort of there's the most need for those sort of wetland habitats and those connections for wildlife and for keeping the extent of the floodplain so we shouldn't allow development to happen you know to sort of like well let's double up and use the riparian area as our filtration zone too it's like let's try not to do that but mm -hmm. this wetland you know scott had made the point when we were talking before this this meeting that being a jurisdictional wetland you can just dump storm water in here yeah but, right but you yeah. could treat it there are ways to to do you know pre-treatment to that and potentially use it or you know in time maybe we'll find a, a design that actually works with this area i mean my first thought was well look you've got this huge planting bed here it's like what do you really need this for this is just being maintained with a mower and spray pack or something so <clears throat> what if this swale actually was narrowed and lengthened it you know potentially forms a privacy buffer for whatever development might have happen on the other side of the parcel where it's upland but it still re retains the values and benefits the key to, you know, like I said on my last slide, the key is to figure out a way to maintain this thing. So absorbing it into our landscape and, and either the managed edge of the park or the managed part of a, a mobile park, if that's what it's gonna be. But somebody needs to take that under their wing. We can get a lot more function out of it if it's sort of integrated into the environment there, the, the built yeah. environment as well as the natural environment. Yeah, cool. Any other questions or thoughts? I will let you know that um, John Spees of Rogue River Watershed Council gave the City of Phoenix a bid for, um, I think it was $2,500 a year. I'm not good with numbers either, so I could be wrong about No, 25000 Anyway, he gave him, <laughs> sorry, I'm not good at numbers. So 25000 I think, to manage the um, that wetland area for two years. But yeah. Wow. No, no, no. Yes, 25,000 to restore it, yes. 2,000, uh, I think it was 2,000 a year That's to a just maintain it. That sounds oh, about right. That's, That's what it was. Yeah. That's kind of great. in line with what we would consider, you know, yeah. cost, general costs for it, depending on how much site work, you know, planting and, and maintenance ended up happening. But the key would be to do that and, and to really try to reestablish a native plant community mm -hmm. there and maintain it over time. That way we really get the true benefit of the place. We don't just have a wetland feature, we actually have wetland function. So, so it's getting to be um, 7.30, so I don't want to keep people, but um, happy for more conversation. So the last question, and both of you touched on this, is so what can we do specifically about this wetland or any wetlands? I mean, I think it sounds awesome fun to go out with Ryan and do ladders and whatever, whatever with fish. And I'm not a fish person. But it, you know what can what it, what would you suggest? Write a letter to the paper. Write a letter to the council. Write a letter to uh, the Urban Renewal Agency. What? Any I would, thoughts? I would say for the to at least what I'm pushing right now is kind of that best management practices thing is is to not just um, have the have the the riparian setback essentially is the last place that you can do something for your new development so i would encourage the 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 councils um or right right to your your city council right to your city planning um and just let them know that you are watching and and you know that 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 is the plan um, a lot of times you'll have a lot of pushback from developers that well i'm gonna lose one less parcel you know we are in a housing um shortage here and so you know that's 
that's one of the, the things you're running up against. So, um, but I think there can be some kind of compromise with that um, and have it a function or have it as a, uh, a feature of the community um, as they're building. Yeah, so. and if um, the, inc uh, the economic impact to having a wetland, like you talked about, um, one of you talked about, it, it could be substantial for Phoenix, perhaps. Yeah, I think, you, I think we want to be clear that we want to retain as many wetlands as we can and that we see value ecologically and to our community in, in keeping wetland habitats to the degree that we can. We're not anti-development, anti-housing. We're, we're pro-environment and, and ecological services. So, you know, just first of all, advocating through whatever avenue you have uh, letter writing and there will be a process because this wetland won't be altered without some uh, legal process that will happen there, permitting process. So there will be an opportunity like you highlighted in the beginning for public input. I think we want to say yes we want this wetland. We, we're, we're open to changing it to, to perhaps making it into something else that fits within this environment better and, and you know to allow some development potential but we want to retain the wetland and we don't we want to retain the wetland functions. And we want to restore this wetland if we have an opportunity to work with this developer or the city to do that. That would be my take on it. Is like, let's not lose it, but it doesn't have to stay untouched either. There's things we can do that are going to make it better for everybody. So, yeah, great. I'm obviously hoping that the develop. We are hoping the development doesn't happen right on top of this wetland. But we all learned a lot today. Yeah, so sure. I want to thank you both for coming. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.